Hello, this is Pastor David Clayter, once again speaking about the Lord's Prayer and the seven petitions, seven requests that we make from God. Uh, Jesus gave us this Lord's Prayer. We know it's the model prayer. It has all the important things for which we ought to pray. Today we are looking at the third petition. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing as we study this important petition Teach us how to pray it rightfully, thoughtfully, from our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Once again, you need your catechism and turn to page 252 of the catechism. And in the 60 Lesson Catechism book, we're on Lesson 35, which is on page 141. So have those two things open, your Bible also present your highlighter, and your pencil. We are looking at the third petition. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we want to show you a couple things here. First of all, what does an 800-pound, where does an 800-pound gorilla sleep? What do you think the answer is? Anywhere it wants to anywhere it wills to sleep. And you might think the same thing about God. Well, God is God, so his will will be done automatically uh, by him. That's what you would think. God is all-powerful. Uh, but there's a reason why his will is not always done here on earth. And the main reason comes to us from 2 Timothy chapter 3, where the question is, Jesus promised to come in his second coming, but he hasn't come for 2,000 years. And some people will mock Jesus and say, where is the promise of his coming? And Peter gives the answer. He says, God is not willing for any to perish, but God is patient with you, not willing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In other words, if God had acted solely in his justice and his righteous wrath when Adam and Eve sinned, he would have simply wiped out mankind, or any time after that, wiped out humanity. He would have been completely just, but he chose instead to save people. And uh, he's not going to force people to believe. And so he gives them time. And uh, so, for example, you have the Apostle Paul, who was a terrible persecutor of Christians, threw them in jail, uh, had many of them killed, and we're told that God was patient with Paul. He gave him a period of time, waited and waited, and all this time Paul's persecuting, hurting Christians, doing evil, but God gave him time, and at a certain point, Jesus appeared to him, the risen Jesus, and uh, Paul became a Christian. And then he became a great missionary of God. So it was God's patience. Uh, and in his patience, he let all this evil go on, uh, giving uh, sinners a chance to repent and be saved. And so one can complain about all the evil in the world, but God has a gracious, loving purpose for allowing it to go on because he's giving time for sinners to repent. And so God's will isn't always done right away on earth because he's giving sinners a chance to repent. And as he gives them time, they go on living in all of their evil. So that's just kind of a, an answer to that question. Why isn't God's will done uh, all the time like we think it would get done? So, what are we asking God to do when we pray this third petition? I'm going to give you some ideas here. First of all, it is God's will that we teach his word purely. And here we connect with the first petition, which you remember is, Hallowed be thy name, review. What is God's name? It's not just his title, but everything we know about God in his word. So when Martin Luther 
gave an explanation of the first petition. Uh, he says, uh, what does it mean, hallowed be, be thy name? I'm looking it up here again, page 242 of the Catechism. God's name is kept holy when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity. And we as the children of God lead holy lives according to it. So God's name is everything we know about God in his word. And hallowed means holy. So help me to teach and learn your holy word um, and live my life according to that word. So we come back to this, uh, what is God's will? Well, the first petition tells us that we teach his word purely, correctly. So that's God's will. So we kind of connect back with the first petition here. Hallowed be thy name. Let God's word be taught in its truth and purity. That's God's will. What is the second petition? So let, let me uh, just stop there a second and read this, this verse from Jeremiah 23. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word, God's word, speak it faithfully. God wants his word taught purely, faithfully, for what does has straw to do with grain? Okay, the second thing, let me go back. It's God's will that sinners are brought to faith in Jesus and enter into his kingdom. Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 2, this is good and pleases God our Savior who wants all people, that's all men, all people, to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So God's will is that all people are saved. Now we're connected to the second petition, thy kingdom come, let more people be brought into God's kingdom of grace. So here we are in the third petition and we're tying back into the first two petitions. What is God's will? That God's name, that his word is taught truthfully and people believe it. Secondly, that his kingdom of grace grow, that sinners are brought to faith in Jesus. So again, what you want to do here is to get some things in mind so that when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're not just saying the words. That doesn't do any good. That's no prayer at all. You want to pray the prayer with meaning. So get some thoughts in your mind. So when you pray, thy will be done, Lord, uh, let me learn your word. It's your will that I learn, learn your word. And it's your will that I come to faith in Jesus and I believe in him and that others come to believe in him. So what is the will of God? That I learn his word and that I come to faith and that other people come to faith. And that kind of leads to the next one. And then that I lead a godly life according to your word. So actually points one and three both hearken back to the first petition. The first petition again, God's name is kept holy when the word of God is taught in its truth and purity. That's number one on the screen here. And that we as the children of God lead holy lives. That's number three on the screen here. And then when you get to the second petition, how does God's kingdom come? when our Heavenly Father gives us his Holy Spirit so that by his grace we believe his Holy Word. So sinners come to faith and we believe in Jesus. So it's kind of interesting here. The third petition picks up on the first two petitions and say, what is God's will? Well, we already learned what God's will was in the first two petitions, that we learn his word and teach it purely that we live holy lives according to it, and that we believe in Jesus, our Savior, that we are a part of his kingdom of grace, and finally get to his kingdom of glory. So what we're doing here is summarizing what, uh, 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 what we're learning in what we are to learn in this petition, thy will be done. So far as this third point goes, to lead godly lives, look at this Bible verse below, Paul to 1 Thessalonians Finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. 
Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. And then he gets specific. What is God's will? That it's God's will that you should be sanctified, live a holy life, and that you should avoid sexual immorality. That's sexual intimacy outside of marriage. So it's God's will, point three, that we live godly lives. Okay, so we just gave you a summary of this petition and in picture form. Here it is again. That the word of God is taught, it's God's will, that the word is taught purely, that we believe in Jesus as our Savior, as, as we hear uh, in the word of God, and then that we live holy lives. So you've got the meat of this petition right away here. Now, ask a question. Is the third petition a missionary prayer? The second petition was a missionary prayer. Thy kingdom come. We want God's kingdom to spread to also the lost, the unbelievers. This third petition is also a missionary prayer. It's God's will that the lost are found, that the unbelievers become Christians. So yes, so this is a second time we see in the Lord's Prayer that it is a missionary prayer. Let's talk about this for a second. How is God's will done in heaven? We pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, in heaven, it's done perfectly by the angels. So we're praying that God would help us to, to do his will perfectly here on earth. It's an amazing prayer. Okay. However, there are forces that are trying to keep us from doing God's will. And so we are talking here about the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh. So, now if you would go, let's take a, a moment here to go to our catechism, and we'll look at page 252. At the very bottom, it has in bold and italics, and I'd like you to highlight that. As Christians, we pray here that God would not allow any obstacle to stand in the way of his gracious will. And what is his will? Namely, that his word and his kingdom be extended. Now, under his word, write really small, first petition. And we just got done talking about that, that we're asking God's will to be done. What is his will? Look at the first petition, that his name, that is his word, be kept holy. And then the second petition, right under kingdom, second petition, that his kingdom remain in us, that we remain in his kingdom by faith, and that it be extended to others. And so, he nicely, in this paragraph, says God's will is that what we learned in the first and second petition. Now, if you go to the top of page 253 of the Catechism, highlight 261, what is the will of God? And now we're kind of reviewing, highlight that paragraph. God's will is that all people come to know him as their father. It's a missionary prayer. And live under the rule of his son. This petition is closely related to the petitions that his name be hallowed and his kingdom come, as we already explained. Now, go to question 262 in the middle of the page. What is the specific focus of this petition? I'd highlight that and the answer. We ask that God, in keeping with his will, would never allow Satan, the world, and our sinful flesh to take God's name, first petition, and faith, second petition, from us. Now I'd like you to look at these Bible verses. These are our enemies. Everyone should know his enemy well. And we as Christians have three enemies. The first passage is 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Wonderful passage. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, your enemy, the devil, 
prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Uh, the devil and his evil angels wish to hurt property. They wish to hurt people. We have stories of people who are demon-possessed in the ministry of Jesus and of Paul. He wants to hurt people's bodies, their property, but especially destroy their souls and take them to hell and, and eternity. And he's like a roaring lion. So you walk out your door, and if you had a lion prowling around trying to devour you, boy, you would be on the alert at all times. And so we are to be alert to the devil. He's out in the world. He's, he's tempting us to sin. He's trying to deceive us, to believe lies. There's all kinds of lies in our world today, and he wants us to fall into those. So we have a horrible enemy. And we're praying, God, I want your will to be done in my life, but the devil's trying to keep your will away from me. He's trying to destroy your will, so protect me from the devil. That's your first enemy. The second is the world. Now we look at page 253 of the Catechism and read at the bottom of the page, 1 John chapter 2, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So now we see the world is not used in the sense of God's creation. God's creation is good, but this is the world in its fallenness, in its sinfulness. What would be involved in this whole word world? Well, it would be unbelievers, for one, who try to lead us into lies. So if you have a professor at school and he says, well, evolution is true and God never created the world, that's the world speaking. That's the world's lies that are speaking. Uh, if uh, someone says, uh, I want you to go into the store and, and uh, rob some candy uh, and stick it in your pocket, don't pay for it, that would be uh, your friend then, not, not a friend at all, really, but someone trying to encourage you to do evil. That's the world. Or maybe uh, it's uh, a, uh, a TV program where, where men and women are taking off all their clothes, and so they're encouraging us to lust. That would be the world, all the sinful influences of the world. And that's all around us every day. That's a temptation to us. And then our own sinful flesh. So look at the bottom of page 253, Romans chapter 7. Paul says, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. And you really need to know that phrase, my that flesh. This is the ESV, English Standard Version translation, and that is in my flesh. Uh, some translations, like the New International Version, try to simplify it for us and say our sinful nature. So we know we're born as, with a sinful nature, with sinful desires and sinful inclinations. And so uh, there's this part of us that's evil and, and wants to sin, uh, our sinful flesh. So, you know, say you're looking at this picture on TV and uh, people are starting to take off all their clothes. And so uh, then your sinful flesh uh uh, it, it comes into action there and it says, hey, I want more of this. I want more of this. I'm going to watch more and I'm going to start uh, lusting in my heart. So that's the sinful flesh. Or uh, someone does something evil to you and you think, oh, I hate that person. That's your sinful flesh speaking. That's not what God wants you to do. So the sinful flesh is a horrible enemy. So we have an enemy outside of us, two of them, the devil who is unseen and then the world, all the sinful influences of the world, and then something inside of us. So if great enemies, and these three enemies do not want the will of God to be accomplished. So on your 60 Lesson Catechism book, page 141, I would simply write these things in. At the top of the box, I would write our enemies, and then next to the planet there, the earth, I would write world Next to the person on the right, I'd put our sinful flesh, and the snake there, of course, is a reference to the devil. So I'd write the devil there. So keep in mind your three enemies. Now, what are you praying in this petition? You're saying, God, please protect me from these three enemies that seek to hinder your will and keep it from happening. 
Okay, so now you turn to page 140 of your 60 lesson catechism book. At the top it says, if Jesus is our king and God is working out his epic plan, oh, that's not right, I'm sorry, turn to page 150. Ha, <sighs> what is God's will for me? It says uh, each part of the Lord's Prayer works with others, works with the others as we've studied already. Questions 261 and 262. Okay, well, let's look at those two questions. 261, page 253 of the Catechism. Highlight what is the will of God and that first paragraph, God's will is that all people come to know him as their father and live under the rule of his son. This petition closely relates to the petitions that his name be hallowed and his kingdom come. And I might have had you, <coughs> I might have had you highlight those already. What's his will? Ezekiel 18, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live. So God's will is that all people be saved. And then we had 1 Timothy 2, 4, we already looked at God desires all people to be saved. And then 1 Thessalonians 4, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that is that you live a holy life. What is the specific focus of this petition? We ask and highlight all of this. We ask that God, in keeping with his will, would never allow Satan, the world, and our sinful flesh to take God's name and faith from us. Okay, um, so on page 142 of their 60 lesson book, it says fill out in your own words what God's will for us in light of the introduction our father who art in heaven because God has made me his child in Christ what is God's will because he's made me his child he wants me to pray to the father that's what I wrote in because he's my loving father he wants me to pray to him the first petition hallowed be thy name and because God is perfect and holy hallowed means holy I put down, he wants me to learn, teach, and live by his holy word. Hallowed be thy name. God's name is everything we know about God in his word. So it has to do with his word. So he wants me to learn, teach, and live by his word. That's what I wrote down. The second petition, thy kingdom come. What is God's will for me? He wants me to stay in his kingdom by faith and lead others into it. That's what I wrote down. What is God looking for me? What's his will? He wants me to stay in his kingdom and he wants others in his kingdom. And because God rules over all creation as king, I put also and he wants me to be with him forever. Thy kingdom come. He wants me to take me to be with him forever. Under that, then it says the third petition, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God's will is that I pray for all people to hear his word. Thy will be done that all people, that the will of God is to save all people so that all people hear his word and enter his kingdom. Now, under that it says how does God do this? Read question 263. Okay, that's on Catechism page 254. Highlight question 263 and the two answers. A, how does God do this? Well, God restrains Satan and he breaks and hinders every evil, evil plan and purpose of the devil. You look below there and it says 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 3, the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. Protect me from the evil one, Satan. Um, so he restrained Satan. Now I'll give you an example of that. And, 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 and so let's go back to your 62nd, 60 lesson catechism book. And you see uh, page 142 uh, on the bottom left, it has A and it has some chains like uh, uh, 
shackles, chains that you chain up somebody's arms in, in chains. And I, I wrote down, God restrains Satan. Uh, you may remember in the book of Job, that Job was a righteous man, a very godly man. He believed in the Lord. He believed in the Messiah to come. And the devil came to God and said, I, you know, look at this man, Job, and uh, you're protecting him. And uh, if you allow evil to come into his life, he'll deny you. And so God said, okay, you can do whatever you want to, to uh, Job. And so Satan took the lives of his 10 children and he caused a uh, sores to be all over Job's body. But uh, he said, you may not take his life. So we may say, uh, uh, why did God allow all that to happen to Job? Well, God had a good purpose. He wanted to strengthen Job's faith. The devil had an evil purpose. He wanted to destroy Job's faith. And uh, in the end, God got his wish and Job's faith was strengthened. But we see in that story that God has control over Satan. He will only let Satan go so far. So we're asking God, uh, restrain Satan. Don't let him get uh, uh, tempt me too hard. Don't let persecution be so rough that I can't handle it. Uh, uh, don't don't uh, uh, you know, restrain the devil so that your will gets done in my life. On the right-hand side, uh, we have a shield there, and I wrote down, God strengthens us by his word. So, you know, if you look at your physical body, uh, if you don't eat for like half a day, you know, you really start, mm, your, your stomach hurts and you're really hungry, and, and you actually start feeling weak. And so you need to have food. The same way with a Christian, if you don't have the word of God, uh, you get weak. And so we ask God to strengthen us through his word. So you go back to the catechism, page 254. How does God do this? Well, first of all, A, we highlighted God restrains Satan. And B, in the middle of the page, highlight God strengthens us with his word so we can endure the sufferings that will come. So the Bible predicts that if you're a Christian, you will be persecuted for your faith. And in America, we see this coming on more and more, that Christians are being persecuted, that uh, our freedom of, re of religion and our freedom of speech is slowly being taken away from us. And uh, you may have in your lifetime see Christians thrown in jail, uh, that uh, their jobs taken away from them. Matter of fact, that's already happening in our country. And so we have a lot to pray for here, especially in this petition, that God would restrain the devil and uh, that he would strengthen us so that as we are persecuted for our faith, that we don't fall away, that we don't deny the Lord. So God strengthen us with his word so that we can endure the sufferings that will come. And you look at uh, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, Paul had some thorn in the flesh of some kind, some some think it was a physical illness. And, and he said, well, God, I prayed that you take this away from me, this thorn in the flesh. And, and then God said, well, it's better for you to keep, to, to have this thorn in the flesh. And then Paul said, my grace, or God said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So, so when Paul was a weak person, God's power came to him and worked through this weak person. So then Paul said, I, I rejoice in my weakness because when I'm weak, then I'm strong because God works through weak people. It's an amazing thing that he said. So Paul knew that God strengthens us so that we can endure whatever hardship comes our way. So at the bottom of page 142, it says, think about it, is it easy or difficult to think of Satan and his demons, that's the evil angels, planning evil in the world? Is it difficult to think that, oh, there's a devil out there and he's trying to wreak havoc and, and cause all kinds of evil things to happen in our world? Is it difficult to believe that there's a devil? Many people don't believe there's a devil. And I put down, it's hard and it's easy. Why do you think it's hard to believe in the devil? I think because you can't see him. You know, so, 
And there's no devil, I can't see him. However, I think it's easy to believe that there's a devil when we look at all the wickedness in the world. We say, where did all that come from? Well, we know it came from the sinful heart of man. He's the sinful flesh. And that sinful flesh runs wild in the world and cause, causes all kinds of evil, evil that we've even seen in our own country recently, the riots and the hatred and, and such. Um, so we see all that wickedness in the world. We say, you know, there's something wrong with man, with people, and there's something spiritual out there, unseen evil, and that's the devil and his evil angels behind all of it as well. Okay, we're turning to page 143. How does God break and hinder Satan's evil plans in the world? And it says God desires to break and remove temptations that Satan puts in our path so that we can follow God's plan for the world. What is his plan? That we love him. That's the first three commandments. And love our neighbor, the last seven commandments. That's God's will. But hasn't Jesus already conquered Satan's power on the cross? Why does Satan still tempt us? And why should we pray that God would remove those temptations for, from us? So it says, turn to question number 264. This is on page 255 of the Catechism. And there I'd like you to highlight the question 264. When will Satan's defeat be complete? So God is more powerful than Satan. And that's really the story of the Bible from Genesis 3 on. Satan is very powerful, but God is greater than the devil. And A, highlight, Christ has already defeated Satan by means of his life, death, and resurrection. So that's the good news, and we read it in 1 John 3, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. Here's a horrible thing, that uh, those who do not repent of their sins and trust in Jesus are under the power of the devil, under the domain of the devil, and practice sinning that is without repentance. He says that person is of the devil, the Apostle John wrote, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God, Jesus, appeared on earth was to destroy the works of the devil. That was his mission, to take away our sins by dying on the cross, but by doing so, he crushed the head of Satan, as predicted in Genesis chapter 3, and he delivered us from the power of the devil. So think of it this way. You have a pit bull, and he's got a long chain, he's got a leash on, a long chain, and there's a stake in the middle of the yard, and, and, and you, at, and that, that dog, that pit bull is actually the devil, and you were in the circle in his sphere of influence. He was threatening you, going to take you to hell. Jesus came and died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you came to faith, and you were carried out of the circle of the devil. You are now safe from him. He's not going to bite you. He's not going to destroy you. But what's that dog doing? He's trying to lure you back into his circle so he can have influence over you again. So you've been delivered, but you're not completely in the safe yet because the devil's still there, still tempting, still telling his lies, etc., then highlight B on page 255. God has promised that Satan will be banished forever. And with that, death will be put to death and our sinful nature stripped away. So there's coming a day when Jesus comes in his glory. We learn in Revelation chapter 20 that the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire. He will not be able to tempt us anymore. He won't be able to use people to tell lies anymore. And he won't be able to let, lead anybody astray. We will be delivered from Satan forever. So there's two parts to it. The devil's delivered us already. By faith, we've been uh, brought out of his kingdom into the kingdom of God. And uh, there's coming a day when Jesus comes again, when the devil will be defeated for completely, thrown into the lake of fire and have no influence on us anymore. In the middle of page 143, I'd highlight these three points, knowing what we have learned. One, God's desire is that Satan, the world, and our sinful flesh not be allowed to take away our faith. That's the first thing. Two, God desires to hinder the plans of Satan and strengthen our faith by his word and sacraments. And three, 
Satan's defeat was begun at the cross and will be finished at Jesus' glorious return. Now what? What is God's will for me? Answer the now what question in the space below. God wants me, wants to, I wrote three things. What is God's will? What does God want? He wants to save me. He wants to save others and that I do my part in it as well. Kind of like thy kingdom come. Let me help your kingdom come to other people. Let And his will is to save people. Help me to be part of that, to save other people. Learn how to share the gospel. Witness to other people about our Lord so that they can be saved. So first, save me. Uh, help me save others. And help me to keep your commandments. That's God's will, that I obey his commandments. So those are things that I would pray. Thy will be done, Lord. Your will is to save me, to save others, and that I obey your commandments. Right there. That's the, that's the uh, essence of the third petition, thy will be done. And then you can also think, uh, yes, but there's also the devil, the world, and my sinful flesh that are trying to keep me from, keep God's will from being done. Protect us from those evil things, Lord, so that your will, these three things, save me, save others, and help me to keep your commandments so that your will gets done. Okay, now we're on page 144. And uh, this is kind of a little bit of a new area here, which is really interesting to me and very important for us. Uh, and um, let me see here. Let me see here. I'm going to show you a picture here, and then I'm going to go over some things with you. This is a little bit uh, more deep in a sense. Look at that middle box, the Ten Commandments. These commandments say, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And so here, uh, God is very clear. Uh, these are things we should do, things we should not do. So should we say, is it God's will that I murder? Answer, clearly, no. Is it his will that I steal? No. Is it his will that I honor my parents? Yes. That's the fourth commandment. Is it his will that I covet what doesn't belong to me? No. So there's no wiggle room here. This is exactly what God says. Now, but outside of that box of the Ten Commandments, we have freedom or liberty. And God doesn't tell us what to do in some areas. And so we're free to do these things and we're free not to do them, whatever we choose. For example, uh, do you go to Brahms and eat an ice cream cone? Well, you can do that and you don't have to do that. It's uh, not a sin either way. Uh, do you like to fish? Uh, well, you say, yes, I do, or no, I do not. In a sense, God doesn't care. He gives you freedom to do it, freedom not to do it. In the church, on the right-hand side, you say, well, yeah, we have some banners in our church. Is that a good thing? Well, yes, because we actually use it to teach truths from God's word. It aids us in our worship. In our own church right now, we're contemplating getting new carpeting. What color should we pick? Well, I told our people I want to get polka dot color, colored carpet because well, we'd get a lot of visitors that way. They'd say, we're going to go to the church with a polka dotted carpet. Could we have a polka dotted carpet? Yes, we could, uh, but we're not. Uh, people chose to get another color. Would it be a sin to get a polka dotted colored carpet? No, uh, we could do it. We don't have to do it. So there's a lot of play there uh, and a lot of freedom that God gives us in our lives, in the church and in our personal lives. And that's a really a great thing. We call those things adiaphora. That means that they make no, the A means no, diaphora difference. They make no difference to God. So you're going to go out and buy a car, get a little older, and are you going to buy a Ford, a Chevy, a Toyota, um, a Mitsubishi? And in a sense, God doesn't care. He gives you freedom to do it. Are you going to get a blue car, a red car, an orange car? I had an orange car once. Uh, it doesn't matter to God in a sense. I mean, God always cares, don't get me wrong, but he gives us the freedom to make these choices. So we're going to talk a little bit here now about 
how do you make decisions in life? How do you know what is God's will? So you go to the top of page 144 and write down two or three decisions you've had to make. Well, I'm thinking now as a young person, and you look ahead in your life, you say, what are some important decisions you have to make in your life? What are you thinking? You might say, well, when I get older, do I go to college? And if I do go to college, uh, where do I go to college? Um, or you could say, you know, uh, one day I'm going to get married, perhaps. And you say, so marriage, you could write, that's a really important decision in life. Your occupation, what kind of job are you going to have? And one day, are you going to purchase a home or are you going to rent? You know, so there's big, big questions. So what's the will of God in these areas? Now, you go to the next, uh, uh, right under there, it says decisions, decisions. Life is made of decisions, big and small. God's word also shows us how in our sin we naturally don't want to follow God's will for us. That's our sinful nature. So when confronted with a choice, how do you know you're following God's will? How do you know you're following God's will when you get married or you purchase a home or you have an occupation, you go to college? Read question 265. And I tell you the truth, uh, on page 265, I highlighted the whole page. It was a wonderful page. Number 265, what is God's will for my life? God wants me, and I highlighted all of this, to become and remain his child through faith in Jesus, to live as his adopted child according to his word and bear witness to Christ and resist the devil and all that would prevent these things. That's all that we just, just got done talking about. That, that right there, 265, summarizes this petition. And so when you're praying, pray these things. Think about them. God, I want your will done. I want you to strengthen my faith in Jesus and, and, and help me to witness to others so that, that you're saving, that they become saved like me, that's your will, and that I live a holy Christian life according to your word. Keep, me, keep the devil away from me. All those things you can pray in this petition. Then it says, should I be anxious about discerning God's precise will in my daily decisions? Now, it really depends on what those decisions are. We'll talk about a couple of them here. I highlighted this whole paragraph God has given clear commands. We talked about those in that, in that uh, picture I just showed a second ago. There's the uh, clear commands that God has given. Right there, the Ten Commandments, those are clear commands. About He's given clear commands about many daily matters in life, the Ten Commandments. However, God also leaves many other daily decisions up to us. And I talked about this. Go eat an ice cream cone. Don't eat an ice cream cone. Have a polka dotted car carpet. Don't have polka dotted carpet. Other decisions, and then he gives examples. What to eat, where to go to school, what kind of car to purchase, and so on. Let's take a couple of those examples for a second. What kind of car to pur purchase? Does God care, in a sense? No, he doesn't care. Uh... He, he, uh, he always cares, but it doesn't matter to him what kind of car you get, Ford or Chevy. You get the one you like, the color you like, whatever. Okay? That makes no difference to God, what we call adiaphora. Well, what about what to eat? Well, actually, the fifth commandment comes into play here, which is you shall not murder because we are to... Uh, well, let me read the fifth commandment and Luther's explanation of it. I'm skipping to the front of our catechism on page 14. You shall not murder. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and support him in every physical need. Not only our neighbor, but ourselves, our own bodies, so we are not to hurt our bodies. So... Uh, there are certain things that I probably should not eat. Maybe a better example is, you know, should you smoke? Well, what we know about smoking nowadays is that it is harmful to the body, so it's probably something, well, I should say more than probably, don't do it. Don't get started in smoking cigarettes. Uh, don't, don't take illegal drugs. So uh, whatever you eat. Okay, so if you're eating sugar, sugar, sugar all the time, you're, you're downing uh, 10 Mountain Dews a day, with all the sugar, that's probably not good. It isn't good for your body, let me just say. Okay, so 
So in this particular case, the fifth commandment does come into play somewhat. But let's just say um, you're trying to decide between eating a ch uh, you know, uh, chicken breast and uh, some hamburger meat, you know, in that sense, you know, uh, both of them are good for you. Or let's say you're uh, eating broccoli or spinach or green beans, you know, you, you can pick any of those. Those are all good for you. So there's some freedom there, but you really should eat stuff that's nutritious for you. Okay, so then where to go to school? Well, that's a really big question nowadays uh, because uh, in a sense you can go to school anywhere, but the Christian really needs to ask a very serious question, and that is, uh, will I be able to live out my Christianity at that school? And we know nowadays that many universities teach uh, have professors that really want to, to, that contradict the Christian faith and try to undermine Christianity. And many kids are getting out of college now that, that, the, that they, everything they learned in their home and at church, they no longer believe because of what was taught at their school. So you have to be very, very careful. And I really believe that uh, Christians need to think seriously about attending a very faithful Christian college or university. Uh, and, and if they do go to a, a secular university, that they really need to plug into their local church and really learn God's word uh, so that they can hear uh, God's word in response to some of the falsehoods that they will get at school. Okay, so how do you make decisions in life? Let's go to number 160 or 267. There on page 256, how can I make decisions as a Christian about everyday matters? A, God gives me freedom to make my own decisions in everyday matters. Now, I didn't like the way they put that quite because you don't, you're not completely free. You've got the Ten Commandments, okay? So there's no freedom there. You've got to stick to those. Outside of that, like what color of car to buy, what color of carpet to have, there you have freedom, so he makes that clear in the next sentence. He has provided the Ten Commandments to guide my decision-making, and not just guide, but required by God. He also invites me to pray for wisdom, so that's a good thing there. Now, uh, should you uh, uh, go to school at Oklahoma or Oklahoma State or Tulsa University or, or um, uh, you know, Concordia or Concordia University in uh, Seward, Nebraska? You know, now you want to pray about that, okay? Pray for wisdom. Or you're you're uh, starting to uh, get a little bit older and you start courting, you're start looking, getting serious about marriage, you pray about that, about uh, should I uh, give me wisdom and, and who I should select. And uh, pray for wisdom in choosing the best course of action according to his word. So he mentions the word of God. That's the most important thing. B, in making decisions, I can also consider the many gifts that God has provided me in my everyday life. My specific callings. I look at the table of duties. My abilities and interests. The needs of those around me. The opportunities he has laid before me. And the counsel and wisdom of others. That is a fabulous paragraph. and has all these different things we ought to keep in mind. Okay? So let's just, for example, say uh, you get a little older and you, and you leave Broken Arrow and you're looking for a church, okay? So you say, well, what kind of church? Well, most important, does it teach God's word faithfully? Does it teach God's word faithfully? And obviously, as part of our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, we urge you, I think it's very important that you find a church in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. But you want to know, is that pastor teaching faithfully the word of God? Okay, then it says, my abilities and interests. So maybe uh, you play violin. And so you go to that church and you say, can I play the violin in, in the worship service? And the pastor says, oh, that would be great. We'd love to have church music and instruments and stuff like that. And you say, yeah, I can fit in right there. Use my gifts and abilities there. Okay, okay. Um, and uh, let's say maybe you have the gift of teaching and 
And uh, so you come there and they say, no, you can't teach. You can't teach here. Uh, we're, we're full of teachers. And you say, well, you know, I can't use my gifts here. But at church so-and-so, they're saying, yes, we really love to have you teach here. So what are your gifts and abilities and can you use those? It's not always, what can the church give to me? Of course, you want the church to give to you, fill your need of hearing God's word, giving you the Lord's Supper. But how can you serve the people there in the church? So I've got the ability to teach. I want to use that ability to teach other people. So I'm looking for a church like that. What opportunities has he laid before me so that I can serve other people? So maybe you can speak Spanish, okay? So, so you go to a congregation and they've got a Spanish ministry and you can use your, your abilities. Uh, and we've got a congregation here in Tulsa that has that. So maybe you'd want to join that church. And then you seek the counsel and wisdom of others. And the Bible talks about that in the book of Proverbs, that it's good to get godly counsel. Maybe you get them from your, your Christian parents or from your pastor or from your Sunday school teacher and you say, lay out the options and say, what do you think? What do you think I should do? So all of these things come into play. See, finally, I can pray for God's blessing on my decisions, knowing full well that I daily sin much and can never completely avoid sin in this life. So you'll find out that sometimes decisions you make weren't the best, and you made a mistake, or maybe you your sinful flesh uh, got the best of you and, and you made a bad decision but there's forgiveness in Christ and and we live under that umbrella of God's forgiveness he says knowing that God my God is a God of blessing who promises to work all things even my poor decisions for my ultimate good uh read and reread that that uh, paragraph now I'm going to summarize that in a minute, but I want to, to make you aware of something. If you turn on your catechism to page 33, and there's a section of the catechism. This was written by Luther. Actually, the first 40 pages of your catechism were written by Luther. And then uh, after that, only the things in boxes uh, uh, is what Luther wrote. And so it has like the first commandment and its meaning here in the beginning, the first 40 pages, and then later on in the Catechism, we start going through the first commandment, and then it has a box, and it has Luther's, uh, the, the, you shall not, um, you shall have no other gods before me, and then Luther's meaning, we should fear, love, and trust, uh, trust in God above all things, in a box, and then the Catechism, all these, all these questions and answers and Bible verses and stuff. But this part here on page 33 is something Luther wrote called the Table of Duties. And it has to do with specific, what we would call stations in life or vocations, callings of God that God has given to you and to me. And every single one of us has a specific vocation. For example, I'm a father. That's a vocation God has given me. As soon as I had children, I became a father. Now I've got certain duties under that vocation. I have another vocation, which is I'm a pastor. So God has given me specific duties as a pastor. He hasn't given those to you unless you become a pastor. Uh, he's given you the responsibility of a parishioner, of a member of a congregation. And you are not a father. You are a child. And so you have specific duties as a child that I don't have. I have duties of father. You have duties as a child. Uh, we both have duties as citizens of a country, but none of us are the ruler, the king, or the president. So there's specific duties. This is called the table of duties. So first it shows bishops, pastors, and preachers. So those duties apply to me. And then what hearers owe their pastors at the bottom of page 33, that is what your duty is. And it quotes some Bible verses. We're not going to read those right now. But then you turn to page 34 of civil government. So if you're a ruler, let's say you're the mayor, a city councilman, the president of the United States, you've got responsibilities. And you and I have duties as citizens below. This is my vocation. My station in life is to be a citizen, a pastor, 
And then you go to page 35. I've got another duty. I'm a husband. My wife has duties. We have duties as parents because we have five children. Our children have responsibilities. You have, that's part of your responsibility. So you have a vocation as a child, as a citizen of a country. And as you grow up, you know what? God adds responsibilities to your life. And that's just the way it is. You need to learn these things. You need to learn how to cook dinner. You need to learn how to wash clothes. You need to learn how to work a job. And uh, you get older, more mature. God places greater responsibility on you. And page 36, workers of all kinds, employers, youth, widows, to everyone. So there are specific duties that God has given to people. So not everybody's duties are the same. So let me give you an example of how that impacts your decisions in life. Uh, my sister uh, is the oldest in our family, and then my brother, and then myself. My mother is 94 years old, and uh, she can no longer take care of herself. So my sister and brother-in-law uh, retired, and so, you know, and they maybe said, hey, let's go on a lot of trips. Let's go, you know, we'll travel all the 50 states of the United States. And, uh, but my mother needed someone to take care of her. So it was their duty, and it could have been mine as well, or my brother's. Uh, but my sister said, this is my duty to take care of my mother. And so, so they just couldn't do anything they wanted to do. They couldn't travel as much as they would have liked to have traveled, but they knew that before God, they had this duty as a child. So you got to take that into account when you are a um, making decisions. And let me go back to this church thing again. I would never move someplace unless I knew that it had a church that could could fulfill my spiritual needs and in which I could serve. So, you know, a lot of times people just move and then they think afterwards, oh, well, I got to find some kind of church. Uh, I would rather say, when I move, I want to make sure there's a church where I can grow spiritually and I can serve God. So, um, these duties that you have impact the decisions you make in life. Again, like with marriage. You marry any old person uh, just because he's handsome or she's pretty or maybe he's rich. Uh, you know, no. You know, does this person have uh, the spiritual qualities I'm looking for? Does this person love the Lord? And uh, is this person willing to share my faith and go to church with me and study the Bible and pray together and teach our children the Word of God? So these are all important things. So I, in making a decision then, let me just, uh, and I wrote this down on page 144, and, and maybe you would like to do this too. How do you make a decision? Well, number one, you look to God's word. Does God's word say anything about this? The Ten Commandments, for example. Second, what are my duties? We just got done talking about the, 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 the um, table of duties, the list of duties that I have. That's a second factor to keep in mind, like my sister taking care of my mother. Third thing, you make a decision. You pray about it. Say, God, help me to see. If I don't see it real clearly, if it's not laid out for me in your word or in the Bible and the Ten Commandments, uh, help me to see what you want me to do. Fourth, consider your giftedness. Uh, and what kind of gifts do you have? Can you use the gifts by, by making such and such a decision, are you using the gifts that God has given you, the abilities that God has given to you? Next, consider the needs of others, not just yourself. So my sister considered the needs of my mother when she made that decision. She'd take mom into the house with, and watch over her. So the needs of others. Next one, godly advice. <coughs> Proverbs 1522, ask others uh, to pray for you and to get, get their advice as to how do they think that, what kind of decision do you think I should make here? Does what I'm planning to do make sense to you? And then the last thing I would put down is that God opens doors. So you're praying about things. 
And you say, God, if you want me to do so and so, then kind of open the doors. And, 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 and when the doors are open, and you say, you know what? That's not just a coincidence. Uh, you know, I was thinking, I was praying about what school to go to. And I thought, well, maybe I should go to, say, Concordia in Seward, Nebraska. And uh, it's, it's a godly place or it can grow in my faith. And you know what? I got the scholarships I needed. You know, well, God opened the door. And, and so you know, now you can step through it. Maybe God opens the next door and, and, and you see the God paving the way for you. <coughs> so um, we've done a lot here. This is a big petition, so much to talk about. That We pray that God's will would be done in our lives and in the lives of others. So let us close then with uh, page 257 of the Catechism, the prayer on that page. Merciful Father, ruler of all things in heaven and on earth, we acknowledge that your good and gracious will is done without our prayer. We pray that you would defeat all that opposes your will, the devil, the world, and our own sinful nature. In your mercy, we implore you to strengthen and keep us firm in your word and faith all the days of our lives and bring us at last the inheritance you have prepared for us in Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And God bless you. Amen.